I'm going to be working with uh, the Acumed uh, hand fracture system. It's a VA system using uh, two, three, and one, five screws. And I'm going to highlight a few uh, plates here. Uh, we're going to look at um, the boxer's fracture plate, which is a periarticular locking plate for uh, boxer's fractures, which typically represent uh, metacarpal neck fractures. Most, most boxer's fractures can be treated non-surgically, but when the fractures are displaced or angulated to a certain extent, typically the numbers we use is more than 40 degrees of angulation or more than two to three millimeters of displacement or shortening, we'll consider operative repair. And there's a lot of ways to do that repair, uh, including uh, what we're going to do today, plain screw fixation. There's also a headless screw fixation, um, pinning, et cetera. When we're approaching the metacarpals, um, where we place the incision depends a little bit about what we're trying to do. So let's say you're dealing with a case where you have multiple metacarpal fractures. Say, and that's very off. That's very common, by the way. They have a middle and a, and a ring metacarpal. You can place your incision between the two and access both. If you're doing just a single metacarpal, then obviously you place it where it needs to be. When you're dealing with boxer's fractures, we tend to place the, the incision a little bit off axis a bit. We can go straight dorsal if we want, but again, we're, with all your exposures of the metacarpals, you're always finding the extensor tendons, which you can see moving um, uh, when we move the fingers. So when you go off axis with the, the fifth metacarpal or the small finger metacarpal, you, you're not fighting the extensor tendon as much. Plus the plate sits a touch um, uh, lateral or ulnar, if you will. So it, it kind of uh, kind of facilitates. But again, whenever you expose in the, the back of the of the um, of the metacarpals, you're always navigating um, the the uh, extension. So I'm going to just do a simple line. We're going to get started here. So ex ignoring all the purple uh, that's here, uh, which you'll appreciate is the extensor tendons. So. The, the small finger and the index finger actually has two extensor tendons. Uh, the small finger has the EDC, the small finger, and then what's called the EDQ or EDM tendon, the extensor to T minimi. And then the index also has the EDC to the index and extensor indices proprius. So the ulnarmost one here is your EDQ or your uh, EDM tendon, whatever you want to call it. So we typically we go uh, ulnar to that. And we, for the most part, just leave it alone. Uh, we don't want to do much with it. Uh, when you're dealing with the other, uh, the other fingers, uh, you often have to go through what we call the juncture tendine uh, to mobilize that space. So we'll do that if we need uh, to do that. But here, the advantage of this technique is we really don't have uh, to do that, which is nice. So as we expose distally, you will, we start to come into what's called a sagittal band, which is right about here. And you often have to mobilize that a little bit in, in terms of seeing your metacarpal uh, head and neck regions right here, this layer here. And if you have to take it, you can. Uh, and we typically will repair this because it can destabilize the tendon a little bit in terms of how it moves uh, and glides over the metacarpal head. So I'm going to take more than I normally would just for the sake of uh, exposure uh, and visualization. So here you'll see we've got our um, our small finger or number five metacarpal uh, dorsum of which are very well exposed at this point. So typically here you'll see your fracture line, I'll just kind of mark it out. Generally you'll see it right about this area here. That's typically where the fracture line for metacarpal neck, aka boxer's fracture, is going to live. And you'll redo that, reduce that in one of a few ways. What I find to be a very easy way to reduce this is, like, I have a fracture tenaculum please, is once I have it exposed, I'll take a fracture ten tenaculum and I will grab this head distally, pull it back, and it's usually flexed. So I'll extend it with my tenaculum and I'll have my assistant drive a uh, K-wire down the pike like so. And that will do a nice job actually of reducing it. And I typically start my wire more volar in the head uh, of the proximal phalanx, not dorsum here. By overcorrecting uh, the, the, the head and neck relationship, when I place this in the more volar part of the metacarpal head, when it hits the canal, it by its nature extends the, um, the distal fragment, and that corrects that angulation. And that's really most of my work in terms of doing the reduction uh, of this fracture. So again, we'll apply this. 
It's a, a neat little nifty little holder. And again, it doesn't go straight dorsum. It goes off axis just a little bit like so. So here we go. If you look at this, the plate's probably a touch distal, maybe two or three millimeters more, more distal than I would like. So that's fine. Uh, what I can do now is I can reposition this all together and then re-image it. Or alternatively, I can just put a, a, a screw in the oblong hole in the proximal aspect of it and then slide the plate back. And measure it. These are usually in the region of, of, of 10-ish plus or minus 2 millimeters. I'm measuring uh, a 8.5. Uh, I'll take a 9 cortical screw, please. Thank you. We use a non-locking screw here. I'll take the wire driver back next, please. I'm not going to quite put it all the way down. Like I said, I'm going to slide this plate back a little bit. And what I'm doing right now is sliding it back. You'll, you'll appreciate how it's further back in the hole, hopefully. I move back about two millimeters, like so. And so now I will tighten it down. And we can do a quick image just to make sure. I find flexing the head helpful to kind of uh, see where, where it sits. You'll see it's not proud relative uh, to the head. You'll see how it's sitting uh, off axis a little bit as it's uh, designed to do. If you're happy with the reduction and, and you see that the, the piece is right exactly where you want it relative to uh, the plate and what have you, then you can just go ahead and fill this all with locking screws. So these are cal it's a cal calibrated. I can stop there. I'm measuring a 12 when I hit the second cortex. This seems about right to me, so I'm going to stop. I'll take a 12 locking screw, please. And always locking screw, great bite, and zero profile. So if I put my finger over top of it with variable angles, sometimes there can be a little bit of prominence because there is a 20 degree or 15 to 20 degree arc, arc of angulation. So I'm going to make sure that it's still flush with the plate, uh, which it is in this case with a, with a, nice, uh, with a nice purchase. We'll check it on uh, x-ray. And you can see how, uh, as intended, it's going upward into the head to capture a distal piece. All right, so here's our final, con our final construct. What I want you to appreciate is a few things. One is um, the placement of the plate more radial. I want to appreciate the angle of the screws, the display, um, and the inner digitation in the distal fragment, recognizing that this is a, a paraticular fracture, so you can't go by cortical anymore, right? So we did take that one screw out that we used for the reduction screw. It doesn't serve a purpose anymore. And check out its position there as well. It looks great in terms of all screws in the head. No, no screws are bicortical. Uh, they're going in different directions. When then you are, whenever you're doing any kind of finger fracture surgery, you want to make sure that your, uh, your cascade has been restored to your hand. Uh, it's always trickier when the patient's asleep uh, to, to know for certain, but you can kind of just passively manipulate and see where it wants to go. You can, you can, you can, you can tension uh, the forearm um, by squeezing the forearm muscles here. Again, it's, it's a cadaver, so they're not alive, so they don't have normal tone. You can squeeze here, and this will pull down as well and make sure they're pointing all to the scaphoid. The small finger typically just tucks in gently 
uh, under the ring finger. If you're not sure, uh, you can just check the other side. Um, and getting that rotation right is very important um, so that um, the patient's not bothered by it because that's often the most common complaint with any kind of finger fracture, despite, regardless of how it's treated, is any kind of crossover or malrotation.